uh, you know, it's the third time he's introduced me, and it, it, it always makes me blush because it's such a nice introduction, and I feel so honored. So thank you for having me. It's always so warm, too, Darren. It's really beautiful. Um, I just want to start. It, it, I do speak in many places, but it is a particular honor to be here. And the, one of the reasons is I don't know of any other organization that is doing more to change things than Advocacy Unlimited. They really are charting a new path, a new way of thinking. And the thing that I find so extraordinary and so amazing and so inspiring is they're not just, you know, it's a group with uh, individuals with lived experience, but they're not just trying to provide healing services, healing programs to other people, uh, peers, but to the community at large. And I don't know any other organization that has its roots in, you know, with lived experience that is becoming a force for wellness in the larger community. And that is extraordinary, and it's such a model that I hope other organizations copy. But congratulations, it's terrific. Uh, Darren talked about, you know, I just want to say one other thing on this. By doing this, um, Advocacy Unlimited is becoming like a social force for creating a better society, actually, a more just, caring, and loving society. And I think that's so important. Darren mentioned uh, about battles of narratives, that there's a conventional narrative, and now there's people trying to create a new narrative. And that's really how I see where we're at as a society. We've had this conventional narrative, and I'll talk about that real briefly. And I think so many people are saying that conventional narrative has failed us. And now we're trying to rethink what is possible. And that's sort of the counter narrative that is going on not just in the United States, but increasingly as the conventional narrative, the biological model got exported around the world, you see society after individuals in society after society rebelling against that conventional narrative. I recently was in India, for example, and there were people from I forget how many countries, and over and over again was the story about how the conventional narrative isn't working, and that in some ways it's an impoverishing society. So what do I mean by the conventional narrative? If we really look at how we as, as a society in large have organized our care for, quote, mental health services, it really goes back to 1980, the big defining moment. And that's when the American Psychiatric Association published the third edition of its Diagnostic and Statistical Manual. Now, Jeffrey Lieber Lieberman, a former president of the American Psychiatric Association, said about that book, it's the most important book that's been published in the last 50 years. And he didn't just mean in psychiatry, he meant period. And I agree with him. That is the most influential book that has been published in my lifetime. And I'm getting older. <laughs> and here's why. It is not just a diagnostic manual for psychiatry. It's a philosophy of being, really, that is incorporated in that book. And what they did in DSM-3, of course, is they adopted their disease model. They call it a medical model, but it's a disease model. And what they say is, okay, the child that's not doing well in school or not paying attention has ADHD, which is seen as a brain disorder. And if you're suffering, if you're, you know, whatever might be happening, if you're, you're struggling with your moods, your emotions, all the things that are so common to human beings, that's a disease. And it locates all these problems in the individual. They say the problem is in your head. That's where it resides. That's where the disease is. And if we can somehow uh, reduce those symptoms, that's we're going to be treating a disease. But if all those problems get located in the head, there's two things that happens. It says it, it completely takes away the impulse for creating a more just society because it's no longer about poverty, it's no longer about crappy schools, it's also no longer about all the things that we struggle with as human beings. So it, it thwarts the impulse to create a more just society. It also separates us, right? Because we say, oh, over here are the people who have, quote, a mental illness, 
And supposedly there's all these normal people over here. So it makes you think, okay, there's some others. And now one of my favorite things I like to say about the DSM, go read it. And if you're not in it, check your pulse because you're not alive. So what I want to do today is talk about, so this battle of narratives is happening everywhere. And really it is a fight in our society for how to think about ourselves, how to organize our schools, how to think about our children. And you know, Michaela talked about suffering. Well, I can remember, you know, in college, and everybody suffers in college, I think. But the sense was, you know, you'd read your existential philosophy is that suffering was, you needed to suffer to sort of become a more empathic human being. And when we eliminate all this, we really impoverish who we are. So I think this is a battle. When you talk about this battle of narratives for the soul of the United States, our philosophy, it involves every single person, how we're gonna raise our kids, etc. So what I wanna do, and, and as Darren said, uh, I haven't given this talk before. I recently was in Norway to report on this new initiative by the government that really uh, brings home this battle between narratives. So what I'm gonna talk about is how the initiative arose, how it's stirring uh, resistance, and then finally, and this may be the most boring part of this talk, I just wanna look at what the science says. Does the science support the counter-narrative or the conventional narrative as this battle is taking place in Norway. So here's what happened in Norway. And these user groups um, actually have very different philosophies. If you see the, the man who's the second from the left, he comes from a group called We Shall Overcome. And We Shall Overcome is one of the oldest psychiatric survivor groups around. It was started, I think, in 1968. And you can hear from the language they saw it as a civil rights battle. But you have in this group as well some people who are much more uh, moderate in their understanding of mental health. And I think there's even one group that approached this with a very conventional sort of biological understanding of mental disorders. But what this group did is they came together around a single topic. And that is, was there was too much forced treatment in, uh, in, in Norway and forced treatment that extended out into the community. So once people got forced treated in the hospital, so often they were discharged, and now they continued to have to take medications, antipsychotics out in the community. And there, we often think of Scandinavia as this very enlightened place. It gets really hard to ever escape from that forced treatment uh, by the state. So they gathered together around one issue. We want to fight forced treatment, and so if we're going to have forced hospitalization, we want to have what we're gonna call medicine-free treatment. In other words, in hospitals where we will not be forced to take medications if we do not want to have them. So they began uh, lobbying for this really back around 2005, but this group itself, individual groups did, came together in 2011, and they began promoting this one idea. We want options within in hospital settings where if we do not want to take antipsychotics, we can still get care. So the health ministry there, beginning in 2011, began supporting this idea of, from the user groups. Now why did this disenfranchised people suddenly have some political clout in Norway? Well, that goes back to the fact that Norway, beginning in the late 70s, really decided to remake itself around as a society with two sort of principles. One was to try to be, have sort of as much equality of opportunity, gender equality throughout society. So for example, they now have rules that if you have a, a business, 40% of your board has to be of each gender. And in terms of, if you look at political parties, they, make, they actually will have one woman nominated and then one man and they'll just alternate like this. So it was part of this idea of equality uh, throughout the society, sort of a democratic equality. The other thing they wanted was that the people themselves should have access to power. 
in every, in every form. So in other words, if you look at a business, the workers, they had to, the, 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 the people running the businesses would have to meet regularly with the workers to talk about how the company should be run. And in hospital settings, every hospital was required to set up user councils where they could hear what patients wanted and what was going wrong. So there was a democratic sense of, of reforming the society from the grassroots. So this group was able to meet with the health minister and the health ministry and they got his ear and they said, okay, this makes sense. If you want medicine-free treatment, if there's some people, we should have patient-centered care and we're going to order it. So every year the health minister said, um, uh, and there's four regional authorities that provide health care in Norway. And they said to the th regional authorities, you have to start providing medicine-free care. And no one did. Year after year, because psychiatry said this is the psychiatrist, the psychiatric establishment said this is malpractice. So they wouldn't do it, they wouldn't do it, they wouldn't do it. So what finally happened was this. A, Norway was seen as having some of the highest rates of forced treatment in all of Europe. Two, data came out about people diagnosed with severe mental disorders, I'm using their language, dying early. And then finally, Norway looked like every other society that has adopted this biological model and said, things aren't getting better. The burden of, quote, mental illness in our society is going up. We have more and more people on disability, et cetera. So something's not going right. These user groups want us to try a different idea. So they ordered, the health ministry ordered its regional health authorities to start setting aside beds for medicine-free treatment. And the first place, and it, it was no longer a recommendation, it became an order, and they had to have this in place by January 1st of 2017. And this is the first place in the world now where you can get treatment, as that, excuse me, in the Western world, where you can go, if you're in a psychotic state or whatever you might have, and find a ward where they will do whatever you want in terms of medication. They call it medication-free, but some people arrive there on medications, they can, can come off, but if you don't want the medications, that's fine, okay? So that's the understanding. Now, where is this? This is 215 miles north of the Arctic Circle, so it's about as far from uh, the powers of Western psychiatry that you can find. And when I was up there in February, the sun had just made its reappearance after many times away. Oh, whoops. So here's the psychiatrist who's really championed this change. Uh, and he comes from a different background. He comes from a, a, a dialogical perspective, so he doesn't believe in diagnoses. He believes in pe hearing people's stories, so it's no accident that it happened at this ward. Many of you have heard about open dialogue, right, in, in, in Finland? Well, he actually was one of the people that helped get these dialogical practices started. And just so, so you know, that says in Norway, medic medication-free treatment center. And, whoops. And here's the point. The people who are now involved in it, the, the director, uh, Magnus Hald, the people, the patients there, they all see this as a complete paradigm shift. This is a new way of approaching things. And so Magnus Hald was given, he got uh, the equivalent of about $2 million to set up and run this ward for a year. And they all see this is it. This is a moment where we're going to see if we can have a completely new paradigm for taking care of people. And here is a, a, a quote from the director of the ward. And you can see what she says. We, the providers used to think we knew what was best for people. That's not how it's working here. We're just saying, what, how can we help? And we think that the, quote, patients are the experts, and they're going to let us know what they need. So and this is what I want to talk about is um, patient-directed care. That's, that's the whole philosophy. And you can see from the minute, what does that mean is how they're approaching people? that the people, no matter what state they are in, have autonomy and have some insight into themselves as to what they want. And they are there not to uh, control those people, but to serve them. 
and to create an environment that is safe, responsive, and utterly non-coercive. And here's um, Magnus Hall's perspective on this. We have to see this perspective as valuable. We have to honor it. If patients say this is what they want, no drugs, that is good enough for me. That's all I need to hear. Because they're letting them say, what will help me? And so that really, I think if we talk about, is it medicine-free treatment, as if that's what is um, you know, always happening there, that's not the case. The case is, what does the patient want? And even if they come in on medication or tapering, even then it's, it's so patient-driven in terms of like, if they want to stop tapering, it's not meant to be medicine-free. It is what the patients want. Now, one of the things, so I went there and I spent a couple of days there. How is the ward organized? There's no locked wards. If the patients want to leave, they just leave. One day I was there, they just said, okay, we're going shopping in town. Uh, and including people who would be seen as psychotic, you know, having psychotic symptoms. In terms of how the day proceeds, they do take walks, there's an exercise gym, but there's no sense that anybody has to do anything uh, that they don't want to do. And the other thing is there's no diagnoses. People come in and really what the staff do is just listen to their stories, try to be there for the stories, try to provide some feedback that gives them some insight in sort of sense. And here is the big difference. They do not see that the person is, has a pathology, a disease, or that the problem resides solely in that person. They believe in the whole dialogical sense, the problems reside in in-between spaces. So if someone's talking about, there was a woman there and she comes from an indigenous community, a Sami community. A Sami is an indigenous group there. And she, she had, yeah, you know, it's this. she had left this community and, this, and then she came back. And in many, like many indigenous communities, this one was, it, it's, a, it's having a lot of stress in terms of alcohol, domestic abuse. And so she came back there and she really wanted to see if she could bring some happiness to her small community. And she ran into problems with the community and she began thinking that, oh, I need to be like a lightning rod and take all the evil out of the sky and sort of save the community from that evil that is surrounding us. Well, when she came into the place, they saw it as, okay, she's having a problem with her relations to her community and they brought in people from the community to sort of discuss this relationship. So you can see how much of a different approach it is. So, and by the way, if people want to leave the hospital, they can leave. I mean, just discharge themselves. You have to apply to get there. That's the only problem right now. But you can discharge yourself. Um, I will say this, when I went there, I didn't even know who the patients were and the staff were because there's just no representation of that. When you sit there, there's a kitchen there. Uh, you just all eat together. So it is a very different experience from any hospital that, at least that I've been in. Here. So, what has mainstream psychiatry said? And this debate is still going on. This is wrong. We are going to kill people with this initiative. And you can read this. And wa look, watch this. Drug-free treatment is not only a bad idea, but simply may end up being an introduction of systematic malpractice in Norwegian psychiatry. At worst, lives lost. And this is the key phrase, the most seriously ill often lack understanding of their disease. They do not see themselves as sick. This is the classic idea in which you rob people of their autonomy with this idea. The freedom of choice the health minister now wants to impose will thus lead to a lot of very seriously ill people being deprived of the right to the best possible treatment. So you see the battle of narratives here? One is saying the patient really does know best, we have to honor the patient, we have to listen. The other is the old sort of paternalistic, we know what's best and if you don't like our medications, it's because you don't know you're ill. And you'll see an attitude this. that largely supports a pronounced skepticism about drug therapy, in other words, about psychiatry. 
And you can keep going. I cannot be responsible for the teaching of psychiatry at the University of Oslo that would support this development. These are the leading psychiatrists in, in Norway now rebelling against this. And part of what happened when I was in Norway, they organized a national debate, so to speak, on this very topic. Is this malpractice or is this a good thing? And Jan Ivor Rosberg was uh, the person who made the case that this was malpractice. And I was one of the people there to say, not only is it not malpractice, it actually is supported by the evidence base. In other words, psychiatry's own research supports that this model of care could lead to better outcomes. So I hope I'm not gonna bore you with this next 30 minutes, but what, one, one of the things that, as I've come into this whole arena, I came in from uh, this door, as a journalist writing about medicine and science, okay? And I began, I entered this door with a completely conventional understanding of psychiatric care. That conventional understanding was we are making great progress in understanding, this goes back to the late 90s, understanding the biology of mental disorders. We had these drugs, antipsychotics, you hear antipsychotics as if they were antidotes to psychosis. Um, and that people should take antipsychotics for life, and that if people didn't like them, it's because they didn't know what was good for them. So I had a completely conventional understanding. But I also had this, an appreciation for what science may be telling us about this whole story. So I spent a lot of time digging into psychiatry's own scientific literature to see if it supported the conventional narrative. So what, as we see these battle of narratives, I was asked to present, is there some evidence base, in fact, in support of it? And so now we're going to go over that evidence base. One small note. So uh, Donald Trump right now is not particularly popular in many parts of Europe and in Norway. <laughs> and uh, Jan Rosberg, when he gave his talk, he let off and he called me the Donald Trump of anti-psychiatry. <laughs> And I'm pretty sure it wasn't a compliment. <laughs> so, first thing, in the conventional narrative, the thought is if you do not give people antipsychotics right away, like say for a first episode, you're denying them helpful treatment. And that the conventional narrative is that people did not used to recover from psychotic episodes until we got the antipsychotics. So you wanna see, is that true? Is it true that before the use of antipsychotics, people didn't recover from psychotic episodes? And what do we see in the literature since the arrival of antipsychotics, okay? And as you're gonna see, I'm gonna show you. You know what the recovery rate from first episode schizophrenia was from 1945 to 55? This is the first antipsychotic Thorazine arrives in 1955. In the conventional narrative, we say people didn't get better, they got stuck in the mental hospitals. In fact, it was 67%, roughly. 60, two thirds of people within a year would have had uh, remitted their psychotic episode and they would be discharged, okay? Then we're gonna look at, okay, supposedly in this conventional narrative when they introduce antipsychotics, it improved discharge rates. It's what made it possible for people to leave. Now, that's not true, you'll see that. Then as we begin to look at longer term outcomes, you will see this history. That, from 1960s forward, that time and time again, over the long term, even with people diagnosed with schizophrenia, it's the unmedicated patients that have better long-term outcomes. So what you're going to see here in the next 20 minutes is a scientific story that completely belies the conventional narrative, but the good news is what this story does, what this story of science tells us is of a, of a truth that we have forgotten. And that is people can enter extreme states, people can suffer greatly, people can sort of really lose connection with reality if we wanna talk it that way, but it doesn't necessarily mean that's a permanent state. And what you see is people can recover from those states so often and go on to live, you know, they can recover. There's a resilience that we're gonna see in this literature. So, let's go back to this first question. What were we seeing in first episode schizophrenia patients? And when I say schizophrenia, I'm talking about that you were diagnosed in that way, okay? 
from 1945 to 55, in the decade before antipsychotics arrived. Now, the NIMH in 1956 held a conference on this. They said, okay, how are we going to know if these new drugs are helping us? And they said, well, we have to look at what outcomes we're getting in the 10 years previous, and now we have to do better than that. So they held the conference, and here's what they reported. Roughly two-thirds of our patients, first episode are discharged within 12 months. That's what they said. Anywhere from, and then this, this longer one was even as much as 85% uh, were discharged by the end of five years. So you know what you're seeing here? Imagine 100 people come in to a hospital in 1950 with diagnosed with schizophrenia. Roughly 65, 70, 75 percent of that initial cohort would be gone within two, three years. Be back in the in the community. That did mean that there were, you know, 20 percent of that initial cohort that stayed there, and that became your quote chronic population. But we have forgotten about all these people that would have a psychotic time, get better, and go back into the community. We just remember the chronic population that got built up. And the other thing is this, we did not have a social service net at this time. So what were these people who had been in the hospital, what were they doing five years later? Well, if you go to 100 people that went into a hospital in 1948 to 1950, and you went back five years later, roughly two-thirds were functioning okay in society. They were working. They were getting married, that sort of thing. But we completely forget in the... So... Uh, because I was in Norway, I just looked at what were, the, what were outcomes in Norway. They were basically the same there. You'll see that um, for all patients in four years, they looked at the first episode patients, and about two-thirds would be discharged. This is their psychotic patients and, and not readmitted. So they had a single episode of psychosis, okay? They did not become chronically ill. And now we want to look at, they bring in the drugs, did these improve discharge rates of first episode patients? This was the largest study ever done. It was in California. You'll see it's involved more than 1,400 patients. And look at the discharge rates for the hospitals that did not place their uh, patients on antipsychotics. 88%. So this is, once again, we're seeing this history of resilience and possibility of recovery in the absence of an uh, initial use of the drugs. And you'll see... it would. Now, many of you have gotten degrees, you've studied abnormal psychology. How many of you were quoted this, and presented this information in any of your textbooks? This is part of the problem is, we don't hear the real research literature, the, the full things. What we get is little bits of research literature that support what the conventional narrative. You'll see it's the same thing in, in outcomes for psychotic patients in Norway after the introduction. It just didn't change in terms of the discharge and not readmission rate. So there wasn't this great leap forward. This is the same thing. They then now they looked at different types of diagnoses, and you'll see there's no improvement in Norway in their discharged and not readmitted patients, the first episode. Now next... Uh, Samuel Bachoven, he was a longtime psychiatrist at Boston Psychopathic Hospital. We get the drugs introduced in the mid-1950s. If you go back to the 1960s, people were saying this, clinicians. Well, maybe my patients are getting better faster, but it seems like they're coming back to the hospital more frequently than they used to. And they even invented a phrase for this. They called it the revolving door syndrome. You've all heard this. Well, this really happens in the 60s. So what he did... He had outcome data for people treated in 1947 with not drugs, because they didn't exist, but psychosocial care, five-year outcome data, and he had similar group of patients, first episode patients treated with psychosocial care but no drugs in 1967. And what does he find? He finds there's a higher relapse rate in the modern cohort, and the big difference is this. In that old cohort, they were working. 76%, okay, were successfully living in the community at the end of five years. They were working, functioning. Now what he found in the modern cohort is they mostly were on welfare, socially dependent. So he says, we've seen a shift from people coming back, able to function in a society, to a much more dependent population. What does he say? These drugs may not be indispensable. 
Maybe they're in fact prolonging the social de uh, dependency of many discharged patients. I'm gonna skip this because I gotta uh, go faster. <laughs> so real quickly, let's just look at other long-term studies, every one I can find done since in the, in the modern era. Here was one done at uh, University of California, San Francisco. It was designed like this. People come in, this is in the 1970s. People come into an emergency room. They're either randomized to drug or randomized to no drug. It's not even placebo. Then they're discharged and they're followed for three years. No meds off. This is your medication free group. Means they were treated without meds in the hospital and they stayed, once, you, once they were discharged, people were free to do whatever they wanted. So people, that's the group that stayed off throughout the three years. Antipsychotic off meant randomized to drug and then they took themselves off in the three years. So what do you see of the group treated initially without meds? 41 people were treated with meds. 24, two thirds, never went on meds and basically were recovered. You'll see that very few were rehospitalized. So what statistic does that remind you of? What were we seeing before the use of meds? Two thirds got better. And they didn't need the meds. They had a time of psychosis. That's what you're seeing again here. But what happened to the group that uh, was put on antipsychotics right away? You see two things here. They have a higher rehospitalization rate. You see that? Eight to 47%. And look which group has the highest rehospitalization rate. It's the med compliant group. You see that? So what you're starting to see is a shift towards greater chronicity. I am gonna to have to run through this, but what you'll see here is Rappaport says, we were surprised by this, and maybe we need to rethink use of antipsychotics. The second one was, a, there were three studies done in the United States in the 1970s to re-study, to reassess should we be giving everybody antipsychotics on first episode? And how are they affecting longer term outcomes? And because remember, you know how drugs get approved, right? Eventually in the hospital with medications right away, or they were taken to a house, a satiria, an old Victorian house, which was staffed by people, as sort of Michaela said, who could just be with others. They could just provide a sort of comforting environment. They wouldn't try to change people, they wouldn't try to force anything on them, but the thought was they could have a safe environment. One small thing about this, the man who directed this project, who lived on, who was the head of the project on site was named Voice Hendricks, and Voice was the cousin of Jimi Hendrix, and one of the reasons I think this project was successful is because they had someone like Voice Hendrix sort of making the place a very warm environment. So ran for 10 years and what did they find? Oh, and here's was the drug use. If you got randomized to Soteria, you were not put on medications right away. But, and if you continued to improve, then you wouldn't be put on antipsychotics. But if you didn't improve, then you would be put on antipsychotics, okay? And it's a selective use model. It's trying to figure out who can get through that first episode without going on. That's a good escape valve. And if people aren't getting better, well then maybe the, medica the medications have a place now, okay? And by the way, they would give people medications to help them sleep, not an anti-medication thing. And what happened with this selective use model, which is sort of a medicine-free model that they're trying in Norway? Um, at six weeks, the Soteria group was doing just as well as those treated conventionally in the hospital with medications. But at the end of two years, this alternative form of care that didn't look at it as a disease, tried to provide a safe place, had produced better outcomes. Okay, in, on, on every domain of functioning. And again, what did they find at the end of two years? Only 20% of their patients at the Soteria were regularly on antipsychotics. And they really found three groups of patients. 40% never needed to go on the medications. Another 40% used them temporarily. And only 20% seemed to need them long term. So it's a selective use model. And you'll see if he says, contrary to popular views, we have to rethink this. This is the head of schizophrenia studies saying this in the 1970s. So start watching this time and time again when people are taking, looking at two things. Can some people get through a first episode without going on medications? They're finding that to be so. And two, long term, what do we really see? We see three groups of people. 
One group that never needed to go on, one group that seems to have benefited for a short term, and a smaller group that seems to, to need them longer term. Real I'm going to get behind here. <laughs> Real quickly. So in the, in the 1970s, the World Health Organization ran a, a cross-cultural study. They compared outcomes in three poor countries, India, Nigeria, and Colombia, uh, versus the US and other, five other rich countries. One study was two years in length, one study was five years in length, and here's what they concluded each time. The outcomes of those living in the poor countries were much better than in the rich countries. And they actually concluded, and this is the thing that got me interested in this whole subject, that living in a developed country is a strong predictor that if you're, not diagno if you're diagnosed as schizophrenia, that you will not have a good outcome. Think about that. You know where the best outcomes were in the whole world? Rural Nigeria and rural India. So, after the first such study, the researchers hypothesized, well, maybe the outcomes are better in these poor countries um, because they take their med they're more medication compliant. Now, that's a valid hypothesis. If the medications are supposed to be so essential, compliance should lead to better outcomes. So they measured medication usage, and what did they find in the second study? In the poor countries, they used the drugs differently. They used them acutely, but not chronically. It means they used them for the episode, but they didn't try to maintain people on the medication. So we have a cross-cultural study that is saying something uh, different. This is the best long-term study we've ever had in the United States. It's done by a psychologist at uh, University of Illinois, Martin Harrell, along with a psychiatrist named uh, Tom Job. Here's how the study was designed. 200 people come into uh, two different hospitals in Chicago. Uh, one's a private hospital, one's a public hospital. They want to have a class-diverse group. They're treated conventionally with medications. Then they're discharged, and Harrow is just going to follow them and see how they're doing it 2, 5, 10, 15, and 20 years. The hypothesis of this study is that, and he's going to measure symptoms, functioning, and whether they're using medications. The hypothesis is at this time, the people who come off their medication are going to be found to be doing horribly. He expects to produce results that will confirm the conventional narrative. And you'll see here, you see the age is young. Half his first episode, and then we get another 20%. So he's following them from their early course. And what does he see? By the year, this, he ends up, by the way, he starts with 200 patients. He ends up with 145 patients in his study at the end of 15 years, and he, meaning he did a really good job about following up on everybody. Of the 64 diagnosed with schizophrenia, about 25 quit taking their drugs by year two. And you'll see in this data, at the end of year two, they're basically the same on anxiety symptoms, right? But what happens between year two and four and a half? What do you see in the graphic? What do you see in the blue line? People are healing off medication. This is the only place you see in the research literature this long-term healing. It doesn't show up in those six-week trials, and it doesn't show up in studies where you yank people off the drugs and say, look, they relapse and get sick again because that does happen in those studies. But here you see long-term healing. Cognitive function is better for the off-med group at every form. Here's a kicker. It was the group off medications that was much less likely to be psychotic at 10 and 15 years, leading to the suspicion that some, for some reason, the medications are causing a biological change that actually makes people more vulnerable to psychosis. How about recovery rates? And his recovery, you had to be asymptomatic, you had to have a decent social life, and you had to be working or in school. Look at the difference in recovery rates. At the end of two years, it's not much different, but at the end of five years, it's, it's eight times higher. It's 40% to 5%. And that difference in recovery rate stays throughout the study. And again, when does the separation happen between two and four and a half years? Work history. Remember we said before the time, if you look at first episode patients, people are working? The group that got off here was working, and guess what happened? So what Harold did that was so brilliant here is he managed to follow people after they left the psychiatric system. And the people that stopped medications and did okay never went back to their psychiatrists. They disappeared from the system. 
And what Harold said is, we don't see these people who disappeared. And guess what he found 15 years later? There was one person who was a lawyer, there was one person who was a professor, there was someone else who was a teacher. And what he found was, if people came off and did well, they melded back into society by and large. They didn't say, hey, say I'm a lawyer now. I used to have a diagnosis of schizophrenia. They didn't say that part of their story. So what he found was this possibility of recovery. Now, remember I told you I came at this as a journalist. As a journalist, my belief is you just have to have all the information out there. Here's what Martin Harrell said about his study when he was appearing in 2008 before the American Psychiatric Association. And just read that. This is their own research. The best, it's funded by the NIMH. Okay, all of you who read about this finding and read about this conclusion in your newspaper in 2008, raise your hand. How many have seen this on the NIMH website? How many saw this in your textbooks? This is the problem. They don't let us know this because it completely challenges the conventional wisdom. And so we as a society organize ourselves around a different belief system. Now, I don't have time to do this, but just, I'm not going to go through this. Here's a Netherlands study. What they find? They found those who tapered from the medications had twice the, the recovery rate than those who stayed on. How about, this is a long-term study in, in Denmark. What they find? Out of 303 patients, at 10 years, there were 20, 121 who were non-compliant, not taking their medications. And then when they look at those who were non-compliant at baseline versus those who were, were compliant, had the exact same sort of uh, spectrum of uh, baseline severity, what do you see? Higher emission rates for those off, higher employment rates for those on. This is just a finished story. What do you see? Those off. Uh, higher in remission for those off more likely to be employed, more likely to be married, and much less likely to, to be in disability. So, what is science telling us in this battle of narratives? When we look at long-term outcomes with our conventional form of care, say for psychotic patients, that conceives of people of having an illness of the brain, something patho, you know, some sort of brain dysfunction, that needs to be treated with medication. And we organize ourselves around that story. But their own literature tells us a very different story. And what their own literature tells us is this. If you look at people who have a psychotic episode for whatever reason, many people will get better if they get safe care. And many people will have a single episode of psychosis. Now, there may be another group that, in fact, has a longer time of uh, psychosis, and maybe they really do need a tranquilizer or something that helps them quiet them uh, to get through a period of time. But then there's a second group that clearly can come off and do well. And it really seems that there's a smaller group that needs to be on antipsychotic medications or, for whatever reason, seems to find them helpful over the long term. So science actually is telling us reinvent our care, starting from the very first moment that people come into the system, say with the psychotic, quote, symptoms. And the medicine-free ward in Trumpso is basically aligning itself with that story. So if you come into this ward and you're having a first episode break and you say, I don't really want to be on these medications. In fact, actually, if you have a first episode break, that's what they're geared to is not medicating. But what they'll do is basically, they'll just be there for you. They'll listen to your narratives and they'll see like, can we fix, help with the fixing these uh, in-between spaces? And finally, it's this. You know, when I, when I was there, I asked the patients, what was it? I don't, don't, patients, is, they're not even th seen as patients, but anyway. What's it like to be here? And you know what they all said? It's like a refuge. It's like a time out. It gave me a safe space. And I was struggling and I was suffering and I needed a safe space. And they even said this, you know what I'm so happy about? If I go home and I struggle again, I know I can come back. 
this can be a place of safety for me and I'll be welcomed here and I can have a time out. That is a very different way of conceiving of how we organize our society to help each other. So if you go there, if you travel to the north of the Arctic Circle, you suddenly see a ward that offers a very different vision of what's possible. And it's a vision where people, as Michaela and Darren talked about, people just meet each other there, they provide safe havens, they provide a way to listen, and they provide a place to share suffering. And the, the people, at least at this point, that are there are saying, this is what I wanted. I want a space like this. And as Norway moves forward with this grand experiment, they want to take this attitude and bring it into the community as well, that it's completely patient-directed. So last quote. This is really an experiment that will be watched. If it's successful, my hope is we can learn from it. And I love this. Is this going to work? They don't know exactly how they're going to do things. It's going to be a challenge. But if this works well, the whole mental health system has to change. This would transform the system. And this is why I wanted to speak about this. This is an experiment that really is providing care consistent with the philosophy of that you hear voiced by Advocacy Unlimited. And if this becomes the prevailing narrative, if we as a society adopt this narrative, we will change what we do, how we think about mental distress, and I guarantee you, if we do this, we will create a more just, loving, and caring society. So thank you.